Okay. Um, thank you everyone for being here. And for those of you at home who didn't hear, we're having some technical difficulties. That's why we're starting a little late. Um, so welcome to the session on the local landscapes. We have three presenters, each of which will speak for about 20 minutes, and then with 10 minutes of QA. Um, I'm going to very quickly introduce each person. If you want to know more about them, you can read their full bios on Occupy. Um, and when you ask questions during QA, uh, please be mindful of the fact that other people might also have questions. So keep your questions uh, short and to the point, and please have them be questions. So it be, this is not really a question, but more a comment kind of. Uh, okay, um, are you ready? Okay, so our first presenter is uh, Dr. David Falk, who is a research associate at the NST and has a PhD at the University of Liverpool. Egypt and the Sinai underwent dramatic environmental changes in its ecological history. Over a process of 8,000 years, Egypt and the Sinai were transformed from a savanna to an inhospitable desert. In this paper, we'll discuss how climate changed in Egypt and the Levant and the ways it affected migratory groups and ultimately changed, shaped Israelite identity. Egypt and the Sinai today are extensions of the Sahara Desert. On average, Sinai gets approximately 40 millimeters of precipitation per year, usually as quote, storms of 10 millimeters each of rainfall. But it is also true that the Sinai once had tremendous amounts of rainfall. The peninsula still retains the scars of dry riverbeds of the Wadi El Arish, the feeder canals of which cover a third of the peninsula's area. So to get an idea of what the Sinai and its people were like, we need to go back to the Neolithic period to look at what the climate was like. From 24,000 years ago to 11,000 years ago, precipitation began to decline, leading to the level of Lake Lasan dropping 240 meters that contributed to the formation of today's Dead Sea. Similarly, sea levels began to rise during the late Pleistocene and into the early to mid Holocene, circa 10,050 to 2700 BCE. So that Lake Timsa had once been part of the inland sea caused by an intrusion of the Gulf of Suez. Likewise, through to about 2300 BCE, the Sinai and Sahara were grasslands and savannas. The, Sever the Sahara was a savanna, and the Sinai was covered in verdant green fields and forests. These verdant lands host wild games such as gazelle, hartebeest, and wild hare. On the edge of the Sahara, elephants, giraffe, lions, hyenas, flamingos, and rhinoceros would approach the outskirts of the Nile Valley. Through the Sahara and into the Levant, tribal groups hunted and gathered. Sedentary agriculture, uh, sedentary agrarian culture, settled the Nile and failed forming the Nakata one and two cultures. Ivory knife handles and slate cosmetic palettes were decorated with hunting scenes, revealing that during this period, Egypt still had wider contact with the fauna of sub-Saharan Africa. At the end of the Egyptian Old Kingdom, circa 2185 BCE, the Neolithic wet period came to an end. This changed the environment of North Africa and the Levant, initiating environmental degradation of the Sahara Desert. Sea levels dropped dramatically. On the Gulf of Suez, a port near the Wadi El Yar was built during the construction of the Pyramids of Giza of Dynasty IV. That port today is completely underwater. At the same time, the Sinai also transitioned from green fields and forests to a savanna. This climate change diminished the amount of wild game that had been available to tribal groups living in the Sahara and Sinai, forcing them to see new areas where they could obtain sustenance. While the situation in the Sinai had not become as dire as what had occurred in Sahara, many Semitic tribal groups chose to relocate to the Nile Delta rather than change their methods of foraging. As the Nile Delta still provided ample opportunities to pasture flocks, catch fish, hunt fowl, as well as pursue, pursue sedentary agriculture. 
This influx of people, however, did not escape the Egyptians' notice. While the Egyptians only sparsely inhabited the Delta during the Old Kingdom and First Intermediate Period, they relied upon the Delta as an emergency food reserve in the event of crop failure. During the First Intermediate Period and Egypt's Civil War, less was being done to protect Egypt's borders, allowing Libyan and Semitic tribesmen to settle in the Delta during Dynasty 11, circa 2169 to 2029 BCE. Many settled at the site of Hukweru, better known as Avaris. During the remainder of the First Intermediate Period and the Old Kingdom, the Egyptian population grew, as did the need for more secure food reserves. Sidwasser II, circa 1921 to 1914 BCE, turned the hunting lands of the Fayu into agricultural land by diverting the water from Lake Oeris. However, the agricultural boundary of Egypt was highly vulnerable to changes in ecology, particularly the wild swings in precipitation in East Africa's Nile Basin. High precipitation spelled agricultural abundance, drought spelled famine. And at the end of the reign of Amenhotep III, circa 1875 to 1832 BCE, the Nile was experiencing both record highs 5.1 meters for regular year 30, and lows 0.5 meters for regular year 40, which probably had a stabilizing effect upon the agriculture. Unrelated to the rains in Africa, Canaan had its own rain and drought cycles. Humid weather comes off the Swiss Alps and then is blown eastward, creating torrential rains that made travel in ancient times arduous, but also restored Palestine's water reserves. Should that human fund be pushed southward into Egypt, this could mean rain, flash floods, hail, and even snow for Egypt that reached as far south as Thebes, but drought for Canaan. Such droughts have been known to persist for a decade and possibly longer. Such a drought occurred in the late Middle Bronze Age, which caused a second wave of Semitic migrants to leave the Levant and find food relief in Egypt. The migration mentioned in Genesis 42.5 involving Joseph and Jacob was in all likelihood part of the second wave of Semitic immigration. These events also coincide with the ascendance of the Hyksos 15th dynasty, circa 1666 to 1538 BCE. The Hyksos were Amorite Semitic rulers that entered Egypt during the first wave of Levantine immigration. They ruled from the Delta region to Thebes during the Second Intermediate Period. The sons of Jacob were said to be given the land of Goshen, Genesis 45.10, which in Genesis 47.11 is also called the land of Ramses. Fortunately, we know this as the ancestral holdings of the Egyptian Ramesside clan. The land of Goshen was the agricultural land around the cities of Avaris and Piranesis. The biblical text claims that it was the best of the land of Egypt, which was not a hyperbole. Here's a photo of Goshen today. The area is still one of the most productive agricultural regions in all Egypt. During the Middle Kingdom and Second Indian period, there had been several famines recorded in Egypt, although which famine occurred during Joseph's life is impossible to say. Nevertheless, the Hyksos having a stranglehold on Egypt's larder put the Egyptians in a position where they were forced to exchange their land for food. The Hyksos having ownership over Egypt's agricultural land is attested in the biography of Nes, scribe of Ta, son of Hui, who wrote that King Akhmos I awarded his soldiers with land grants which had belonged to the Hyksos. And while the Semitic population brought with them aspects of the native culture, for example, burial cultures, the their customs, religion, and home design, their new environment imposed upon them changes in culture. They went from sojourning pastoral lifestyle to sedentary agriculture in the orbit of a central city. While some groups of Semitic tribes attempted to continue their sojourning lifestyle during the so-called 14th dynasty, a combination of unsuitable environmental conditions, i.e. marshlands, and Hyksos power consolidation 
made sojourning as a lifestyle ultimately unfeasible in the Nile Delta. This meant that Semitic settlers had to adapt to agrarian life. They built homes of mud brick in cities and worked the fields nearby. They began to worship Egyptian fertility deities, deities. for example, Hathor, and adopted Egyptian purification rituals, for example, ritual bathing. They also traded their agricultural products with domestic and imported goods that came by ship. Additionally, while the Sahara had become, for all practical purposes, a complete desert by the first intermediate period, the Sinai lingered on as a savanna through the late Bronze Age. During its savanna period, the Sinai still had blood grasslands where, the, where Midianites raised their flocks. The Sinai also had acacia and almond trees. As a turquoise mining operation at Serbi al Qaeda, dozens of slag heaps have been discovered that resulted from copper smelting. The size of these slag heaps suggests that wood for these smelters was sourced locally. The mines at Serbi al Qaeda were operated from the reign of Amun Hat I, circa 2029 20, to 2000 BCE of Dynasty 12, through to the reign of Ramses VI, circa 1149 to 1142 BCE of Dynasty 20. This suggests that the Sinai still had a fair amount of trees in the latter half of Dynasty 19. However, travel in Egypt was not restricted to immigration. There's also evidence of people trying to leave Egypt. Papyrus and Assassin 5 reports the attempted escape of a couple of Semitic slaves that had attempted to leave Egypt through the Wadi Tumulak and were being followed by their captors. From the middle of the kingdom of Count of Sinaway, an Egyptian bodyguard fled Egypt after the assassination of a king who he was supposed to protect. Sinaway is often regarded as a fictional tale but the narrative does have features of a tomb biography. Important for our conversation is that the tale was written during the 12th dynasty, circa 2029 to 1819 BCE, and reflects the Egyptian idea of what the Sinai and Levant were supposed to be like during the Egyptian kingdom. The story of Sinaway begins with the death of Amenhotep I, circa 2029 to 2000 BCE, and the accession of Sinwasra I, 2000 to 1955 BCE. Sinaway mentions during his flight of Egypt that he approached the walls of the prince, which crushed the Asiatics and repelled the sand travelers. This was one of the border Ketan ports that checked the travel of people in and out of Egypt. Once Sinaway got past the Ketan port, Sinaway traveled to the Ketan Ware, which is Lake Timsa, in the Sinai. There, he encounters Asiatic nomads grazing cattle, indicating that the Sinai in the early second millennium BCE still had regions appropriate for grazing cattle. Moreover, Sinaway describes Canaan as being cultivated with figs, grapes, and, quote, more wine than water, end quote. Honey was abundant, and all the trees were numerous. Also abundant were fruit trees, barley, and emmer, and a large variety of cattle and wild game. This seems consistent with what we know archaeologically of Canaan during the Middle Bronze Age 1, and in later times may have even been a source for the Semitic expatriate idea of, quote, a land flowing with milk and honey, end quote, Exodus 38. With respect to the biblical narrative, the tale of Sinaway was written about 400 years before Joseph, if we date Joseph according to the archaeological markers that we find in Genesis i.e. the introduction of the chariot in circa 1650 BCE. 700 years after Sinaway, the Bedouin of the Sinai transitioned from bovine to cabrid herding. The advantage of air climates is that wild bovines are ideal for sedentary agriculture because they keep waterways clean and other livestock. Cattle require copious amounts of water and silage. But in air climates, these become scarce resources. From the reign of Thutmose II to Ramses II, tribal groups of Shasu that settled near Mount Seir in the Dawn pastured their flocks in the Sinai, traveling as far west as the wells of Merneptah in the Wadi Tumulot. During the late Bronze Age, the Sinai was also a transit route for migratory birds. 
Quail that migrate between Europe and Africa are occasionally blown off course into the Sinai Peninsula, where relatively few survive the harsh conditions we find there today. The climate of the Sinai, while severely degraded compared to the ecology of the old Middle Kingdoms, served as a home for many small nomadic groups. Several of these groups survived into at least the Neo Assyrian period and are recorded in Ashurbanipal's invasion of Egypt. The Rastan prison of Ashurbanipal, prison C, mentions the Pa Karer, king of the House of Sinai, end quote. Far from being an empty desert, Late Bronze Age II, Iron Age I Sinai was inhabited by around 40,000 people who competed for the scarce resources. During the Dynasty 19, the city of Avaris was abandoned, which was the largest Semitic city in the Nile Delta, and is generally agreed by those who hold to a historic exodus to be the origin city for the Israelites living in Egypt, given its extreme close proximity to the Ramses, the two cities being only two kilometers apart. Moffat B. Talk estimates that Avaris had between 10,000 and 50,000 people. But the demographics of Semitic cities, for example, like who, compared to the size of the site, indicates that the city could have been as large as the low six figures. A group this size would add pressure to the limited resources of the Sinai. And the Sinai's nomadic population probably would have taken measures to protect these resources from outsiders. Thus, the conflict with the Amalekites was that of a smaller group attacking the stragglers of a larger group to discourage resource utilization, Deuteronomy 2517. This put pressure upon the Israelites to adapt their culture so that tribal and clan customs and ethics became necessary for long-term survival and common security. This is the reason why it became necessary to adopt a Lex Telionis style of justice. In clan-based desert societies, Failure to execute retributive justice opened up a clan to be predated upon by stronger tribes. With everyone fighting over the same resources, the potential for strong and even excessive retribution served as a deterrent. On the other hand, the population density of the Sinai also provided opportunity to cooperate with other tribal groups in order to obtain goods through trade that they could not make themselves, for example, wine. And these cooperative arrangements forge a social protocol and etiquette that is unique to those living in arid climates. These customs include the tradition of protective hospitality, tent culture, camp sanitation, queuing at shared water sources, and safe distancing between these large groups to prevent friendly misunderstandings. Many of the Torah ordinances, many of the Torah ordinances seem to have been derived from a clan-based society that experienced nomadic life under arid environmental conditions. In conclusion, the ecological factors of the Sinai created conditions that inculcated cultural change. Those who left the bars had become accustomed to city living with a wide access to agricultural products, cucumbers, leeks, melons, emmer, beer, salted fish, double bone soup. But once in the Sinai, they had quickly adapted to being pastoralists in an arid climate. They subsisted on salted meat, lamb, goat, quail, fungi, and even locusts, and their customs were adapted for desert living. Over time, we see how the environment compelled early Israelite culture to oscillate between urbanization and pastoralism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, can people at home hear me as I talk from here? See no recognition. Marcus yeah. says yes. Okay, great. Um, so it's now time for Q and A. So um, Astrid, if you could keep an eye on the uh, chat, box. chat box. Yes. So if you are joining us by Zoom, if you would put your question in the Zoom box. There's a chat box. There. Yeah, there. Um, and if you're here in the room, you can just raise your hand the old fashioned way. Laura. It is more of a comment, but I know that uh, David will be able to say things speaking to me. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was really. Fascinated by the description of the Sinai during the period that is usually assigned to those 40 years of wandering 
because really interesting, isn't it? Yes, because imagining the current landscape, yeah. it's very hard to think that with the story of the Israelites grazing so many flocks yep. in that land. And this really um, helps bring the story to life. And it makes more. sense. It makes sense. And, 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 and it makes sense that how, how ecological change can really impact the culture. And really impact the culture. Well, and then you think about, you know, if many of us read the story without the knowledge of that ecological change, then the story shifts in its character to increasingly mythical because we're unable to enter into it. Well, that's, that's the problem. When we look at, say, the biblical text, you have, say, the text, you have its immediate context, but you don't necessarily have its cultural context. And that's the sort of part that we're having to fill in now, is the cultural context. And ecology and the environment is part of that, that context. You know, I mean, who, who used to think that the Dead Sea was 240 meters higher than it is today? I mean, it, it was an incredibly massive body of water once upon a time. I mean, for 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 a uh, change in sea level, that's a, that's a big change. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to yeah, I'm going to read out this question from Marcus. Um, is there any indication that the climate shift in the region was driven by agrarian uh, or pastoral activities? Um, there's no, no indication that the environmental change was driven specifically by uh, agricultural activities. It does seem to be just a global change in the environment. Uh, we see it hit the Sahara first, and the Sahara Desert did not have agriculture. Okay? And it just sort of spread from the, from the uh, uh, Sahara, both eastward and westward. So there's no indication that, that that human activity played a role in this uh, environmental change. It seems to be entirely natural. Um, are there? Sorry, in some ways this is going to relate to what I'm about to say. Um, but are you able to see in you know sources from say? You know, 500 years after some of these shifts, mm -hmm. the sort of like misunderstanding of what the world had been before. Oh yeah, already we do. Like for example, during the Roman period, uh, we get uh, people who are um, um, doing, say, pilgrimages to to uh, Mount Sinai, or what they thought was Mount Sinai, and it's already a desert at that point, and they're already thinking that that's the way climate had always been. So that there's definitely that misunderstanding, say 1,300 years after the fact. I mean, we have to remember that these changes happened incredibly slow, over thousands of years. You know, 8,000 years at least right. is, is is that whole transition period, and our our period of recorded history for this is essentially the last 5,000 years. So they're, they're very, very slow changes, almost imperceptible. So it, it is actually no wonder that they didn't, didn't understand this when it came to their, their writings in, say, the Roman era. Right. Well, I guess the question is also then for, say, later passages in the Bible, mm -hmm. you know, are they sort of misunderstanding what the ecology has been you know, during the earlier periods? Or have been updated? There's also that possibility too. It might be a misunderstanding, but they also might be retrojecting as well. Right. Okay. That's always a possibility where where oh, they, that definitely happens. But. Yeah, that definitely happens. And the biblical authors were definitely known for the retrojection. But that's not a misunderstanding. That's sort of updating uh, their current readership using what what they know currently. So it's hard to tell sometimes what's a misunderstanding, what's a retrojection. Do we have a last question? Okay, thank you. Awesome.